Hello, I'm Tacey Ann Rosalowski, oral history consultant for the Research Medical Library at MD Anderson Cancer Center. Today is March 5, 2013, and I'm interviewing Dr. Alfred G. Knudsen at the University of Texas Graduate School of Biomedical Sciences. Between 1969 and 1976, Dr. Knudsen was a professor of medical genetics at the graduate school. He served as dean of the school from 1970 to 1976. During this period, he was also on the faculty of MD Anderson in the departments of biology and pediatrics. At the time, MD Anderson was known as the MD Anderson Hospital and Tumor Institute. Dr. Knudsen held a simultaneous appointment as professor of pediatrics in the UT Health Science Center's medical school. After leaving MD Anderson in 1976, Dr. Knudsen went on to lead the Fox Chase Cancer Center in Philadelphia. Dr. Knudsen is in Houston today to witness the dedication of a plaque commemorating the Alfred G. Knudsen Jr. Outstanding Dissertation Award. Each year, a PhD student is selected to receive this award for outstanding biomedical research. The plaque records the names of students selected in the past with plenty of room for the names of students to be honored in the future. This coming September, the Graduate School of Biomedical Sciences will have been in existence for 50 years. Today's dedication of the plaque that carries Dr. Knudsen's name is the first event in a series of anniversary celebrations. Dr. Knudsen has received many awards, including the Kyoto Prize in 2004 and the Albert Lasker Clinical Medical Research Award in 1998. In 1988, he was appointed a member of the National Academy of Sciences. His two-hit model of cancer causation, discovered in 1971, is the basis for researchers' understanding of how mutations in tumor suppressor genes drive cancer. Welcome, Dr. Knudsen, and thank you for joining me this morning. I'd like to start with some of your, um, some comments maybe about your discoveries and your research. You're best known for your discovery of the two-hit model of cancer causation. Would you explain that model and then tell me what led you to put together different fields of inquiry to move toward that pioneering work? I was. Uh, trained early in genetics. Uh, when I went to the university the, at California Institute of Technology, I was thinking I would be, go into physics. I had never had any biology in high school. Wow. And um, then after two years of physics at Caltech, I thought, oh, they know everything in physics. Why do I want to go into physics? <laughs> and I know it sounds funny, but that's what I thought. And compared to biology, it was true. And uh, Caltech's uh, biology department, the head of it was Thomas Hunt Morgan, who did the first genetics research on fruit flies. And uh, I thought, oh, this genetics is pretty interesting. It's, they, they make quantitative um, evaluations and um, it has some of the features that I admire about physics. So I'll study that. Mm -hmm. But uh, world, so World War II came and uh, Millikan, who was the head of Caltech, advised us all to join the Army or Navy. So I joined the Navy. A nice person in the Navy told me that they didn't need a PhD in genetics, that I should go to medical school because they need doctors and engineers to stay in school. So I decided to go to medical school. <laughs> and um, so I asked for advice and of course, what medical school do you think they proposed? <laughs> They were from Columbia, right? right? So I went to Columbia Medical School. And actually, I thought that I wouldn't like the first two years, and I would like the, uh, excuse me, I would like the first two years and not the second. And it turned out to be the opposite, because the first two years of medical school were a lot of memorization. And at Caltech, I was used to problem solving. And I got into the 
last two years of medical school and it was all problem solving. What has this patient got? How do you treat it? And so I was never sorry that I had gone to medical school. It's one of the th lessons I try to teach young people sometimes that uh, don't get too set on things and remember that sometimes something that seems like a disaster can be uh, helpful. I mean, after all, signing up and to join an army or navy is a big move. But for many of us, uh, without our intending it to happen, we're put in positions where it actually, in the long run of our lives, was a benefit. Mm -hmm. So how did that interest in working with patients and with problem solving, how did that lead you to your genetic work that led to the two-hit model? Well, first of all, uh, I had to have an interest in cancer. And um, the first clue that I would be interested in cancer didn't come in medical school. Uh, we had almost no instruction in cancer because at that time you could either take it out by surgery or let people die. Uh, there was no such thing as chemotherapy. There was radiation therapy, but that was tricky and you could cause more problems than you're solving and so on. I had a residency in pediatrics. The first year was at New York Hospital, Cornell's place. And uh, we spent, I spent one month across the street at Memorial. And at that time there was a, <clears throat> a 20 bed unit for cancer in children. And there was no full time pediatrician there believe it or not. And so the residents from pediatrics at Cornell rotated through. We each had a month over there. So I had a month of seeing 20 children with cancer. And it made a very deep impression on me. I had seen a person with leukemia and maybe a Wilms tumor, but to see a whole unit of such children stuck in my mind. And um, later, um, when the Korean War came, uh, those of us who didn't really get out into the service because the war ended while we were still students, which is what happened to me in medical school, and I decided um, oh, and so I went into the army for the Korean time, and I was supposed to spend a year in Korea and a year in the United States, but I stayed, stayed two years in Kansas, Fort Riley, Kansas. I think they figured they didn't know what to do with a <laughs> geneticist <laughs> in Korea, a geneticist pediatrician. <laughs> So uh, I had two years there and I felt that the world was passing me by and I should have to go, I should go back to Caltech and study. So this was 1953. I arrived at Caltech in uh, June, I guess it was. In March, Watson and Crick had published their paper. So I was also getting the news that the gene was finally identified. And this is one of the great moments in all of science. And in September, Watson came there to work on RNA with a very important person on the faculty. So, uh, the, there was a whole new world. Mm -hmm. And when I finished uh, there, I went to the City of Hope Medical Center. And uh, they wanted me to be in charge of a small pediatrics unit. 
So you can see what happened. They had children with leukemia and with other tumors. Mm -hmm. And that um, fitted in with my experience at, at, in New York. Mm -hmm. So tell me about the two-hit model. What did you discover? So while I was there, I got to thinking about uh, genetics. We knew that you, you could have hereditary predisposition to cancer and that the cancers themselves have their chromosomes are all messed up. So um, I got interested in the problem of cancer more seriously. And <clears throat> Uh, I also wrote a book at that time. I was asked by a publisher to write a book on genetics and disease. And this helped put the cancer problem in perspective also. Um, but it was still a little too soon for me to do the work that I wound up doing. And uh, what it took was that I made a move away from there to New York uh, at Stony Brook because they asked me to come and start a genetics uh, program in the new school that they were building, new medical school. So I thought, oh, that would be an interesting challenge. But they were very slow moving and I left after three years. And the reason I left is that I got an invitation to come down here and set up a genetics unit. So it was a, 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 an amazing coincidence that at the time that I was fed up with what I was doing, somebody was offering me a job to do exactly what I had been thinking of in the background. You mentioned earlier that this was a wonderful place where people were doing astonishing things and didn't know failure. Well, <laughs> a lot of this was Lee Clark's fault. Yeah. <laughs> Not his fault, it actually is great it's asset. Yeah. yeah. And Lee, how did that... Lee didn't seem to understand Kant. Mm -hmm. <laughs> he knocked the tea out of Kant. How did that environment feed your work at the time? Well, it... it um, First of all, he asked me if I would write a, uh, a, a, a review article for a journal on, on cancer and genetics. So that forced me to think about the problem. And that combined with memories of other things put my mind to how do we explain what kind of a gene is it that's involved in cancer? And it looks like the children's cancer could be very important um, because you're, the child is not very old. And at that time, the thoughts about genetics and cancer were done mostly by people studying adult cancer. And <clears throat> Now we come back to Morgan, because Morgan had a student named Muller. And Muller, in 1927 or so, did an experiment here in Texas. He was uh, on the faculty in, te in Texas. Um, and he won a Nobel Prize for the work that he did here showing that radiation could make mutations in the fruit fly. It was already known that radiation could make cancer. So he put the two together. And in about 1934 or so, he wrote another paper. And his logic was this. We know that radiation can make mutations. We know that radiation can make cancer, but the mutations occur immediately, but cancer appears many years later. 
So this must mean that it's several steps are necessary to make a cancer. One isn't enough. And um, then there was a flurry of papers by other people about how many is it going to be? Is it five or six? And I read that literature over and over and I thought, this is nonsense. They're, they're not going to get the answer. And what do I do with the answer if I got it? How am I going to figure out five or six events? So I wanted to know what's the smallest number of events it could be. My background in pediatrics told me that we needed childhood cancer to look at. And lo and behold, of course, retinoblastoma was not only a, a childhood cancer, but you could be born with it. And it was well known to have a hereditary form. So I thought the lowest number can be two. We can't have cancer after one event. First of all, we know that doesn't happen. The radiation proves that, for example. So, um, retinoblastoma should be giving us the answer of two. So I did some statistical studies that are a little too complicated to go into, but it worked out very well. Mm -hmm. You could explain it. For example, um, how many tumors does the child with the gene already in them get? Because they are usually both eyes affected. And to do a study like that, you say, how, what's the distribution of tumors? And somebody had done experiments uh, or observations here in, at MD Anderson um, previously. I found it in the record room. Uh, an ophthalmologist who had recorded the numbers and there was at the same time a British publication uh, showing this and both of them indicated that if you said <clears throat> um, that the mean number is two um, it works out that this is how many you would expect to have one, two, three, four, whatever. And it was very close. How has the two-hit model of cancer causation influenced patient care and then also influenced subsequent research? Well, first of all, on second, the second part, subsequent research was um, very straightforward because geneticists you know, we have two copies of something, the father's <laughs> copy and the mother's copy, and it suggests you need to lose both of them. Just losing one of them isn't enough. So that was uh, the simple side of it. Um, what, what to do with it um, means that, um, first of all, if you can clone the gene, you could test anybody's blood to see whether they have the gene in their blood. So suppose you have a, a person who has arrived at adulthood having survived childhood uh, uh, retinoblastoma. Uh, the, this person may say, am I going to have a child? What's my child? So it's either zero or 50%. Um, so, depending upon which gene was uh, inherited. Um, so, now all you have to do is a blood test and you know whether they have the gene. So, that plus other things and also uh, it says, let's find that gene and see what we can do about it biochemically or however. So it set in motion a lot of uh, work. And it um, also 
called attention to the fact that there were a lot of other hereditary cancers and that this same approach could be used to, to study them and to finding the gene. And if it's found in the hereditary cancer, you could assume that it would also be in the more common non-hereditary. Scientific research, I mean, people often focus on, you know, what are the eureka moments? Um, but I wanted to ask you about something a little different because scientific research doesn't always proceed very smoothly. Um, and so I wanted to Seldom. ask... Seldom. <laughs> <laughs> so we're on the same page with that. So I wanted to ask you, was there a particular moment that was a real challenge or struggle for you? And what was that? And how did you overcome that? How did you deal with that? Uh. No, it didn't really happen that way because uh, I got lucky. The retinoblastoma gave a quick answer. Mm. You were lucky. Yeah. How long did it take the entire arc of the study till you proved it? From the time I arrived here, it was less than two years. Wow. Yes. Yeah, so mm. The paper was in 71. I arrived here in 69. I wanted to shift gears a little bit and ask you some questions about education now. And um, the first one is, how did you involve trainees in your research and what value did they bring aside from physically doing experiments? I didn't have a big experiment, experience with that. Mm -hmm. um, because uh, first of all, you can tell from what I said that it really wasn't laboratory experiment. It was a um, theoretical mm -hmm. thing. And, um, but I did have a wonder, wonderful experience out of it. When I arrived here, I hadn't been here very long when um, a young woman came over to s see me, whether sh she could come and work in my lab. <laughs> um, and I said, well, I've just gotten here and uh, the, the retinoblastoma wasn't, wasn't in my mind at that point. And uh, she graduated s soon from medical school. And she said she wanted to work on it. So when I wrote the paper, um, that happened rather fast. And I called her up and I said, Here, here's the paper. I said, I'm starting work on a couple other tumors. So if you'd like to come over here. And as the dean of the graduate school, I could use funds for we, we were hiring scientists uh, under, on the budget of the graduate school at that time. They don't do that now. So I let her know that this was happening. And her name? Louise Strong. <laughs> and um, so you'll be interested in this. I um, started to explain to her what I was doing and I was explaining the Poisson distribution. How's the distribution go if, if there are three events? And she looked at me kind of sheepishly and said, Dr. Knudsen, I, I know about the Poisson distribution. My major was mathematics <laughs> in college. <laughs> How often do you see medical people with a math? Yeah. yeah. So, I had a special person on my hands. <laughs> mm -hmm. Well, she had kind of that breadth of knowledge that you were talking about earlier. Yeah. Yeah. Very interesting. And so how did she contribute to the research effort? Oh, she, we, we attacked the, the little, little literature on those tumors mm -hmm. and, and published papers together. Mm -hmm. And then we wrote a summarizing paper reviewing the literature of hereditary cancer in general. Then I said to Louise, I said, Louise, you're on your own now. 
I'm the dean of this place and I can make you an assistant professor. Would you like the job? And she, of course, said yes. And she's been here mm -hmm. since. Mm -hmm. When you think about your own education, what do you think enabled you to develop such an innovative style of thinking about problems? Oh, that's a... I don't know whether that's in my consciousness. <laughs> yeah. mm. um, well, there's, I think a lot of people have um, attraction to the unknown, especially if you're educated. I think anybody would like to do something new, make a discovery. People are curious, mm -hmm. don't you think? I think they are, but I think some people I mean, are more curious than others. Curious people here are yeah. asking questions. Yeah, this is a special place. I spoke to um, Dr. Strong, Louise Strong, a little earlier today, and she said when she remembers, when she remembered interactions with you, um, one of the clearest memories she has of, is of you asking really innovative questions from very different perspectives. Oh. She talked about, you know, going to a lecture maybe from an invited speaker and then afterwards you would really just ask questions that shed a whole new light on what this individual was doing. Oh. So, are you aware of doing that or is that just the way you're wired? I guess that's the way I am. <laughs> <laughs> That's a gift. Well, if you're teased by something interesting, you, mm -hmm. you'd like to little dig, a, dig a little further so you understand it. Mm -hmm. What qualities do you think a young scientist needs today um, to really do innovative work and make a contribution that's going to last? Oh, that's a difficult question because it goes beyond science. Um, mm -hmm. You need curiosity, of course, and you need intelligence, and you need training. But um, there's this difficult problem of supporting the mon with money. And uh, back in the 1960s, I was on the genetic studies section at NIH. Uh, we were funding 60% of the approved grants. That number is now about 8%. And um, first of all, the numbers just are terrible. But in addition to that, um, when we were looking at grants back in the 60s, there would be a few three or four or so, where this might not work, but if it did, we'd really be at a new level. They would get 25 percentile, but they always got funded. Now they never get funded. And these are the most important grants. So that's what the problem is. We have too many grants that are doing predictable research and not enough that are surprises. What, That's my personal opinion. What personal qualities can a young researcher cultivate to ensure that they're going to do innovative work? I mean, the aside from the difficulty of getting that work out into um, getting it funded. I don't know how to answer that because it seems to me people either have it or they don't have it. You have to be curious. Mm -hmm. You have to want to know something. But people are curious. <laughs> so curiosity is just the key thing. Yeah. I've never known a long, uh, somebody who was doing scientific research for a long time that was sorry. That's an interesting thing to say. Yeah, I'm surprised. Yeah. Is there a special um, 
quality of pleasure for someone who is a physician scientist, do you think? Does that make a different attack on the whole well, research yes, issue? in the sense that um, if something can be directly good for people, it's, mm. it's hard to beat. But we also know that some things that are far from benefit to the individual right away. I mean, how about Einstein? Yeah. <laughs> he yeah. didn't help anybody right away. Yeah. 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 So research for its own sake and for Res simply for questioning. Yeah. 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 Um, uh, it, it, it gets you into what's the greatest thing that humans can do? And my conclusion is have new ideas. I want to ask you a question. You know, in the long range. Mm -hmm. People come and go, come and go. But the thing that keeps building is knowledge. I wanted to ask you about mentoring, because you mentioned Louis Strong, and I know you've mentored many other students. No, not many. Not many? No. What about the ones you have mentored? How, what do you feel you've been able to give them, and what should students expect from a mentor? The mentor minimally should know enough to know that the problem is worthwhile to somebody. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and that it looks like the wherewithal for studying is, is available. Those are the two main things that you need, I think. Mm -hmm. And so sometimes this has an effect on deciding where to go. You want to go to a place where the knowledge is available because right. your particular problem may not be studyable in some places. I wanted to ask you about um, the graduate school and you were dean of the graduate school of biomedical sciences yes. for between 70, 1970 and 1976 and indeed we're instrumental in setting up kind of the architecture of that program which still and school which still exists today and one of well perhaps I should ask you what do you think is very distinctive about the graduate school of biomedical science well the graduate school has changed so I the thing I know best is what we were dealing with then and we also had Lee Clark <laughs> And he was a very special person. Um, he didn't understand the word can't. You see what I mean? Mm -hmm. So he asked me to come here and start a program at MD Anderson. I think you know that. And he no sooner got me here than he said, oh, we have to, <laughs> we have to change things <clears throat> because they're going to have a medical school here. And the medical school is going to want the, the genetic center that I was going to have here at MD Anderson and have you make. But the medical school is going to want this too. And we don't want two such places. So we have to make something that's going to be good for the medical school as well as for us. And he said, uh, the answer is our graduate school, because the dean is uh, retiring, and we uh, need to fill that position. And we have an arrangement where you can do things within the graduate school. We have some scientists now who, whose salary is being paid by the graduate school. And so you can start it there if you would be the dean. I said, well, I didn't come here to be a dean. He says, yeah, but this isn't just an ordinary deanship. <laughs> so he's a very persuasive person. Mm -hmm. And uh, I decided to do that. And um, especially after New York, 
in my experience of can't get a, even an answers, even a no, this was really different. What did that unique position of the graduate school and, and structure and, and the faculty, what did that offer to students at the time? I don't know that it affected students very much. Mm -hmm. uh, it had the promise of increasing the, the faculty and therefore increasing the student body too. Um, and perhaps moving a little more toward uh, clinical things, um, especially things outside of the field of cancer. I don't mean to say that they were studying only cancer, but cancer obviously had a big uh, role. And uh, then he introduced me to Shiva Smythe and said, here's the dean, and I talked with him, and I knew that he was a straight shooter and that uh, he would do exactly what he said he would do. And what did he say he would do? He said he would go along with this, having the graduate school do it, and, and uh, service both MD Anderson mm -hmm. and the medical school. And we got the <coughs> School of Public Health involved too. Mm -hmm. So uh, it seemed to me that this was just an amazing experiment that no other place had thought of having a graduate school actually doing something. Usually it was a, a funny place for administration, so to speak. You have the schools that are doing research, hiring people, but they get a degree from the graduate school but we went beyond that. And as you've kept track with the school over the years... Um, Which I haven't done very, very tightly. Very much, yeah. But is, is your feeling that... I, I, one of the observations I have, and certainly from speaking with people, the program has become very interdisciplinary, kind of extending the logic of having these connections between these different um, sub-institutions within the UT system. And I'm wondering, what do you think that kind of interdisciplinary, interdisciplinarity um, offers to a student who is looking to going out into the world today and making a contribution as a young scientist? Well, I think the broadest, the broader base one can create in career is it's better because we know there are going to be new things coming along all the time. Mm -hmm. And right now, for example, we know that we are already on the way of an entirely new world of neurosciences. Understanding the human brain and what it can do is really the future. Um, I just wanted to ask you a couple more questions, kind of about cancer biology in general. And um, cancer biology was really coalescing as a field when you were in, in the first part of your career. And what do you say is, where is it now? What is it, what's going on now in the field that's very innovative? What are the exciting new directions? Well, um, knowing the genetic changes that occur in cancer is crucial uh, because different cancers may have to have different solutions for treatment. Um, we, we know that radiation can kill a lot of cancer cells, but it can also create future cancers at the site. And so uh, there are limitations. And we know from treating some cancers, especially a few of the ones in childhood, that chemotherapy can be very good without heavy costs. For example, when I was a medical student, no child had ever been cured of leukemia. Now the cure rate is 85%. And uh, the, this is due to drugs. 
and they are not horrible drugs in the long run. For the, for the treatment, they might seem that way, but ultimately, they're okay. So we have long-term survivors already. So that's one of the brightest things that's ever happened. But getting into the adult cancers is very tough. Because the adult cancers were really struggling to be made. And so they're rather complicated by the time you have it. it multiple events, and you don't know where to shoot it. The children's cancers, this is the cause. Bang, dead. <laughs> if you were a young scientist today, what fields would most excite you, and what would you select? I think uh, the neuroscience is really the future. How, how do our brains work? It's a pretty interesting field. Yeah. Yeah. And we, we, we know quite a lot, but there's a lot to go. I think it's hard to beat that question. Not that people are going to stop doing cancer research, but as you know, we have two kinds of cells in our body. Cells that are renewing, like skin, and um, the problem there is that they may get off track and make cancer. And then there are the cells that we have a limited number, especially in the heart and the uh, neural part of the brain. And their degenerative diseases are the important thing. And so we're always going to have cancer, and we're always going to have these degenerative diseases because they are part of natural, of nature. For example, the oldest people that ever live nowadays are, what, 120 years? And the oldest people from ancient Greece are about 90-something. Somebody like Michelangelo was 93 when he died. So the longest uh, lived people haven't changed all that much through history. But the numbers that get that have changed drastically. So um, we're, we're getting, the, as you know, the fastest growing group of people in the country now, in our country, are those over 90 years old. That group is growing faster than any other group. Well, Dr. Knudsen, I'd like to thank you for taking the time to talk with sure. me this morning. Thank you very much. Thank you.